Now, in our story in the book of Daniel, we're reading chapter 4. So if you have a Bible, please open there. Otherwise, you can just listen. I'm going to read it. Daniel chapter 4. King Nebuchadnezzar. To the peoples, nations, and men of every language you live in all the world, may you prosper greatly. By the way, the whole of chapter 4 basically is a letter from the greatest king of the day, the greatest ruler, the greatest emperor, the most feared leader of the day, a man by the name of Nebuchadnezzar has had an encounter with God and he is going to tell, he wrote, he found it good to write a letter to his entire kingdom. King Nebuchadnezzar, to the peoples, nations, and men of every language who live in all the world. By that, he obviously means his world that he was ruling. May you prosper greatly. It is my pleasure to tell you about the wondrous, or the, mirac the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. I, Neb Nebuchadnezzar, was at home in my palace, contented and prosperous. And then, of course, life turned south for him. I had a dream that made me afraid. As I was lying in my bed, the images and visions that passed through my mind terrified me. So I commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be brought before me to interpret the dream for me. When the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners came, I told them the dream, but they could not interpret it for me. But different to last time, eh? Where he has a dream where he wants... You must tell him the dream and the interpretation. Finally, Daniel came into my presence and I told him the dream. He is called Belteshazzar after the name of my God and the spirit of the holy gods is in him. I said, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you and no mystery is too difficult for you. Here is my dream. Interpret it for me. These are the visions I saw while lying in my bed. I looked and there before me stood a tree in the middle of the land. Its height was enormous. The tree grew large and strong and its top touched the sky. It was visible to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were beautiful, its fruits abundant, and on it was food for all. Under it the beasts of the field found shelter and the birds of the air lived in its branches. From it every creature was fed. In the visions I saw while lying in my bed I looked. And there before me was a messenger, a holy one, coming down from heaven. He called in a loud voice. Cut down the tree and trim off its branches. Strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the animals flee from under it and the birds from its branches. But let the stump and its roots bound with iron and bronze remain in the ground in the grass of the field. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven and let him live with the animals among the plants of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man and let him be given the mind of an animal till seven times pass by for him. The decision is announced by messengers. The holy ones declare the verdict so that the living may know that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes and sets them over the lowliest of men. This is the dream that I, King Nebuchadnezzar, had. Now, Belteshazzar, tell me what it means, for none of the wise men in my kingdom can interpret for me. But you can, because the spirit of the holy gods is in you. Third time he said that. Then Daniel also called Belteshazzar, was greatly perplexed for a time, and his thoughts terrified him. So the king said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or its meaning alarm you. Belteshazzar answered, My lord, if only the dream applied to your enemies and its meaning to your adversaries. The tree you saw, which grew large and strong, with its top touching the sky, visible to the whole earth, with beautiful leaves and abundant fruit, providing food for all, giving shelter to the beasts of the field and having nesting places in its branches for the birds of the air, you, O king, are that tree. You have become great and strong. Your greatness has grown until it reaches the sky. And your dominion extends to distant parts of the earth. You, O king, saw a messenger, a holy one, coming down from heaven and saying, Cut down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump bound with iron and bronze in the grass of the field, while its roots remain in the ground. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let him live like the wild animals until seven times pass by for him. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree. The Most High has issued against my Lord the King. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like cattle and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times, or some translations say seven years, will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes. 
The command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. Therefore, O king, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what's right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be that then your prosperity will continue. All this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, Is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? The words were still on his lips when a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from people and you will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like cattle. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone who wishes. Immediately, what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people and ate grass like cattle. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified Him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as He pleases and the, uh, and the peoples of, he does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time that my sanity was restored, my honor and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out, and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. That took exactly seven minutes to read. For the seven years, this man had to walk through what he had to walk through. Let's look at what happens. We know from Scripture that God resists the proud and we know He gives grace to the humble. So we can learn this morning how to navigate our future successfully by obeying, by leaning into, by trusting God. This chapter is the amazing story of Nebuchadnezzar's battle with pride and then his conversion through the sovereign grace of God. No one could have anticipated this event, especially after the many opportunities he had already had to respond differently to the revelations God had already given him. In chapter 2, none of the false gods of Babylon could reveal to him the content and interpretation of his dream about the future of his kingdom. Then Daniel speaks to him, he hears, and in chapter 2, verse 47, the king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. So he acknowledges God, but he doesn't abandon his worship of false gods. Chapter 2. Chapter 3, which we did last time, God delivers the three faithful servants from the fiery furnace. Nebuchadnezzar acknowledges God again. Nebuchadnezzar approached uh, chapter 3, verse 26. Nebuchadnezzar approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their head singed. Their robes were in scorched. There's no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angels and rescued his servants, etc. Therefore I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut to pieces. Their houses be turned to piles of rubble, for no other God can save in this way. So for the second time, Nebuchadnezzar is very impressed at the God of Israel. However, he's not yet at the place where he's willing to turn from his idols and serve the living God. So now in chapter 4, there's another knock on the door of Nebuchadnezzar's life because he, he now issues a statement out of what happened in his life. He issues a statement to the whole then known world telling them what happened. So we pick up here in chapter 4, God's third warning to Nebuchadnezzar. This event seems to have happened near the end of Nebuchadnezzar's reign. His military campaigns are over. 
His famous building projects, archaeological discoveries have confirmed the splendor of ancient Babylon. It was caused to be numbered among the ancient wonders of the world. It was the hanging gardens of Babylon, the big wall of Babylon, etc. At this stage of his life, he's at ease. He's in his palace. He's enjoying the fruits of his success. He's living at large and suddenly... God unexpectedly speaks to him in another dream. And this dream has another tree. This is a big tree this time. It's even bigger than the idol that he had built up. And it's bigger than the image he saw in his previous dream. It includes an angel, a watcher, that comes down from heaven, chops the tree down, leaves a stump with a band of iron and bronze. Now, if you lived in those days, you knew that a band of iron and bronze put over a tree stump was there just to make sure that it didn't split and rot. It was to give it a chance to grow again. So in his dream, God shows him, or the gods or somebody, shows him this big picture of a tree, a massive tree, touches the heavens, it gets chopped down, and a voice speaks to the tree, telling the tree that it's going to get a difficult time and then it's going to be raised. And obviously, in his dream, Nebuchadnezzar knows that, Nebuchadnezzar knows that the tone of the language has moved from neuter to masculine and a tree can't change its mind. So obviously, he's in the picture here. Um, there's a stump with bronze and iron around it, which means there's something going to happen to it into his future. He doesn't know what's going on. He's a bit in, uh, uh, concerned, obviously. And so what does Nebuchadnezzar do when he's had this dream? He does what he's always done. He consults first with his magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and dividers. Doesn't go to Daniel. Don't think he's forgotten him. He knows who he is. He's had dealings with this guy on two occasions already. But he doesn't want to go there first. He wants to go and do what he does best. And only when they can't interpret the dream, then Nebuchadnezzar consults Daniel. And the reason he does is he says, the spirit of the holy gods is in you. Daniel has a problem now because in terms of royal protocol, you never bring bad news to a king. Now you've got some seriously bad news to bring. What's he going to do? So with great compassion, with great sensitivity, Daniel basically says to him, you're about to lose your kingdom and your sanity. God has seen the pride in his heart. God's going to judge it. But this judgment is not fatalistic. It's not irreversible. If Nebuchadnezzar repents of his pride and his ways, God's not going to bring this judgment on him. Only if he doesn't repent. As a matter of fact, it would almost seem that God is so kind towards him that God gives a seven times. You're going to be like this for seven times. And then, in the language of the day, the seven times means God wants to release an appointed time to perfect a work of grace in his heart. God wants to do something in, the, in Nebuchadnezzar. And God also seems to give Nebuchadnezzar a glimmer of hope through Daniel, because Daniel still says to him in verse 27, O king, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what's right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be your prosperity will continue. Where does this go? What does Nebuchadnezzar do? Like many people before him and like many people after him, Nebuchadnezzar procrastinates. Time passes and nothing happens with the warning given him. So he convinces himself he's got nothing to fear. Maybe the God of heaven has changed his mind. Maybe he can carry on like he always has. But what God has done is given him an opportunity. A year goes by, a full year, 12 months, he's walking, uh, who knows where, but he's walking in the palace grounds and he boasts about all his accomplishment and in one second, God's judgment falls on him. What happens? His mind snaps. One moment. He starts to think he's a herbivore. Goes down on his knees in his royal palace. He hears a voice. Look, look, look what I've done. Look what my hands have accomplished. Bang. This is your time of judgment. His mind snaps, starts to look for grass, and starts to eat it. He's literally chased away from people into a lonely place. You see, God warned him. He said, listen, do this and this, and I'll, I'll work things out for you. What happens? The clock ticks. He doesn't listen. Now, by the way, the possible medical term for this psychological affliction of his is called lycanthropy. Modern medicine and psychotherapy have eliminated these days. But you know, this is the condition accredited with the rise of the belief in werewolves. Did you know that? Lycanthropy comes from two words, lukos meaning wolf and anthropos meaning man. Where people literally look at the, the full moon and they look at this and they suddenly believe they become animals. They literally, some people are so, they can fall down and believe they have become animals. It's largely been dealt with now. 
largely. I mean, we all know some people. But this is a hectic judgment, but God's got a kind purpose in it. And at the end of the book, we see the change, isn't it? Verse 37, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just and all who walk in pride is able to humble. We know that he was restored to a sound mind, humility, and in thanksgiving he worships God. Now I want to get some lessons out of the story we've just read. Lesson number one, pride can fall. It's not only fees that can fall. Pride can fall. God can deal with pride. The king, the truth dawns on him at last. It's taken the best part of a lifetime for him to realize who God is. God has been speaking to him louder and clearer ever since Daniel arrived in Babylon in the year 605 BC. And God would not be ignored any longer. Nebuchadnezzar has a lesson to learn that millions of people are also busy learning it, even if they aren't aware of it at the time. Here's the lesson people are learning. Our God is a God who will not tolerate pride and arrogance. He actively opposes it. Why does God oppose pride more than anything else on planet earth? Because it fuels our need for self-sufficiency. And Daniel has been put alongside King Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel didn't ask to go into exile. Daniel didn't ask for things to go wrong in his life. But through doing it, he gets put right next to the mightiest ruler of the day to speak into his life. And I want to remind some of you that you are born again. You are purchased with a price. You don't belong to yourself. You are a bought, treasured possession, which means God can do with you what He wants, when He wants. And sometimes that new job and that retrenchment and going from this job to this job is not that things are going badly with you. It's because there are Nebuchadnezzars in your world that are so full of pride and God wants you to come alongside them that when God begins to push their buttons, you're the one who's there to speak into their lives. Because God is not as concerned about their job. He's not as concerned about their home. He's not as concerned about their well-being as he is about their souls because their souls are made in his image nothing else is and God is a perfect father and he wants his lost errant rebellious children to come back to him but the biggest thing stopping them is pride and God wants pride to fall he is a God who exalts the humble he opposes the proud he's a God who took from Nebuchadnezzar not only his kingdom but his sanity can I say this to you this morning uh, uh, God doesn't settle simply for religious tolerance from mankind. Oh God, you're there. Oh God, well done. He demands the personal submission of every human being on planet earth. You will either bow the knee now in worship and adoration and praise and humility, or you will bow the knee that on that day in judgment, but you will bow. Every single human on this planet who has ever been, is now, or will be, will bow the knee to God, either now as Lord and Savior or then as judge. But they will bow. Nebuchadnezzar was like so many of the people you and I know. He thought God would be satisfied with a little acknowledgement from time to time. Oh, it's Christmas, let's put up some tinsel. Refused to acknowledge that God is sovereign over all. He thought he's strong enough to resist the demands of God on his life, but time proved him wrong. Pride can fall. The greatest leader of the day fell to his knees in such an extent that he wrote a letter and sent it to his whole kingdom, learn from me. Number two, why does God hate pride so much? Can I tell you why? Because pride is the worst of sins. The worst of sins. Thomas Manton once said, other sins are against God's uh, law but pride is against God's sovereignty because pride says I'll do it I don't need you in the list of things God hates in Proverbs chapter 6 verse 16 to 17 pride or haughtiness is the top of the list in the book of James chapter 4 verse 5 do you think scripture says without reason that the spirit he caused to live in us envies intensely, but he gives us more grace. That's why the scripture says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, he'll flee from you. Someone once said, pride is the shirt of the soul. It's put on first and put off last. Pride shut Lucifer out of heaven. Pride shut Adam and Eve out of paradise. 
It is still the sin that above all keeps people out of God's kingdom. So let's go there. Why? Why is pride such a problem? Number one, pride puts self before God. Pride refuses to submit to anyone else except self. It literally pits our will against God's will. In chapter 1, we see Nebuchadnezzar tries to undermine the loyalty of Daniel and his friends to God by bringing them into his temple, uh, into his palace grounds. Changes their food, changes their clothing. He even changes their name to get them to forget that God because he wants their skill set. In his pride, it's like, I'm going to get you to serve my patched together kingdom. I don't need you doing your own thing. You're going to serve me. Now what happens in chapter 2? God warns Nebuchadnezzar in a dream. I'm going to take your kingdom down. He's impressed. The king said to Daniel, your God's the God of gods. He's the Lord of kings, the revealer of mysteries. You were able to reveal this mystery. Even with a confession of God's power, he still did not stop worshiping his own gods. Then in chapter 3, he puts up an edict and says, you know what? Actually, this dream's bothered me. I'm going to put an idol up and you're going to bow to my idol. And if you don't, I'm going to kill you. The three Hebrew boys go in there. They survive through it. Incredibly. But those three Hebrew boys say, I will not bow. Why? Because in Exodus chapter 20, verse 1 to 3, God spoke all these words. I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. So these three Hebrew boys, they're sitting in idol, threat, death, fire. I'm not going to bow to it. We absolutely refuse. Nebuchadnezzar blows a fuse. He's angry. He's upset. You are going to, I'm going to make sure you go, and all the rest of it. Here's a lesson I want you to learn. God not only rescues the three Hebrew boys, brings them out. Nebuchadnezzar is all impressed. In all of this, I want you to see that God refused to give up on Nebuchadnezzar. How many of you know the hardest person you know? Unchanging. This one's never going to change. This one's so full of pride. This one that. This one that. When you read this passage in your own devotions next time, Daniel chapter 4, remember that the God that you and I serve is able to take the proudest man and bring him to his knees and then raise him up again. God can do that. God speaks a second time, and this time not just through a dream. And this time he says, I declare the people of any nation or language you say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut to pieces. I mean, the irony is that the God of gods who's doing these miracles gets Nebuchadnezzar's approval and his respect, but not his commitment. He still believes. He's a self-made man, holds on to his pride. To haven't you and I known people, and maybe there's some of you this morning, who come to church with a need. Oh, he has a problem in my life. Come to church, God meets that need. And you even tell people, you, you, you clap your hands, you put 500 in the offering bowl. Maybe even you change your Facebook profile to a nice picture for a while. And you just show that there's some change in your life. And shortly, as soon as your problems are over and the issues are gone, you're out again till the next crisis. Obviously, no one in this room hey, has ever been like that. But we all know those people out there, like your second cousin. In chapter 4, verse 4, Nebuchadnezzar says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home in my palace, contented and prosperous. He's not concerned about seeking God. He's not even preparing himself to face God in death. He's not even worried about it. He's conquered every nation of any consequence. Now he's enjoying the luxury and the beauty of what he's achieved. And can I say to you, please, if God blesses you with the fruit of your labor, enjoy it. Just don't put it in front of God. Put your non-negotiables in place. Don't ever let the devil bless you out of God's blessing. Okay, don't ever let the devil bless you out of God's blessing. Every time I try and lead someone to Jesus, and they say, right, Greg, let's talk about walking the road. One of the things I do is I talk about the fact that you need to put non-negotiables in your life. And the first non-negotiable, I tell everyone's church. They say, sure, you should be reading your Bible or praying. I say, no, because when you make a commitment to get up in the morning, get to church, be with God's people, you're making a decision to put His things in front of something else. What most people do is, I'll go to church until or unless a better option arises. Man, if I've got an invite, no, where are you? I bought it, this you Sunday. No, we had a lunch. What time? Now to be there, half past 12. Oh, but we've got an 8 o'clock meeting. Oh, do you now? Let 
This guy's got an aversion to the God of heaven. Things go wrong. Every time things went wrong, he went to his own magicians first. Because he knew that when this guy Daniel arrives, he always brings his God into it and it always changes everything. Isn't it? And you know the Bible says, have you ever thought about it, that you are the fragrance of Christ to those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one, you are the, you are the smell or the aroma of life to life, the other death to death. What's that talking about? You know, sometimes you get into an environment and you just bring life to it and people come to know Christ and you share your testimony and you pray for people and God does things in people's lives. And other times when they don't listen and you go and speak to them, their lives get worse. Even though you're in there speaking to them, the one you the thing of death, man, you're hitting their consciences, they don't want to hear, they get angry. In either way, you're God's vessel. And he knows, I'm not going to bring Daniel out because Daniel's going to bring God into it. And he does. And he's trying to show him repentance is turning from sin to righteousness, from self to God. And at that point in time, Nebuchadnezzar has no intention of doing it. The text says 12 months goes by, a year. You know how long that is? And in that year, he ignores God's warning, goes on his merry way, forgets the lessons. It's scary how easy it is to suppress the truth and our consciences from what God wants. Isn't it? When we know he's spoken something to us. And in his pride, Nebuchadnezzar is taken up only with himself. Because pride dismisses God. Psalm 10 verse 4. In his pride, the wicked does not seek him. In all his thoughts, there's no room for God. I mean, before we become Christians, don't we arrogantly often say that uh, we'll only believe in God if he shows himself to us? He must do a miracle. If he does something amazing, I'll believe in him. Scripture shows that signs and wonders are not enough to save anyone. It's not enough. If someone's holding on to pride already, even signs and wonders will not help them. Nebuchadnezzar sees three godly men thrown into a fire and come out alive. Not only that, he sees what looks like the Son of God. Literally, God joined them in the fire and he still doesn't repent. repent. He would not humble himself. Can I tell you, sometimes you don't need more evidence. You need to humble yourself. You need to say, okay, God, I don't want this pride in my life. Because pride refuses to submit to God. Let me ask you a question. Why don't people naturally believe in Jesus and give their lives to following him? I mean, if the gospel is good news and you read the Bible, when Jesus walked the earth, he had to get up in the morning, early go up a mountain, then he had to go across a dam, and then he had to do this, and then he had to, to get away from people because they're all over him. Today, churches had to advertise to get people in because they don't want to come. But in Jesus' day, they were all around him. Until, of course, the point came where he said, eat my flesh and drink my blood. Then, of course, no one wanted to follow him anymore. Why don't people want to follow Jesus today? If this is good news and it's so exciting and your life changes, why don't people want to believe? I think for the simple reason that Jesus stands in the way of us pleasing ourselves. Pride puts self before God. It exists in all of us by nature. Second thing pride does is it takes credit for God's gifts. God hates pride because we take glory for ourselves. What do we mean by that? God prospered Nebuchadnezzar, but Nebuchadnezzar thinks he did it himself. That's how we all think. The reality is this. Everything good in us, every ability we have actually comes from God our Father. Psalm 100 verse 3. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Paul puts it bluntly in 1 Corinthians 4, 7. Who makes you different from anyone else? Or put another way, what do you have you didn't receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you didn't? And that's what Nebuchadnezzar's thing, thinking it's me. But by the end of it, verse 34, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven. My sanity was restored. I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified Him who lives forever. He starts to realize that everything I have is actually given me from above. But pride makes you think it's all yours. The third thing pride does is it's delusional. Because pride helps you think that you can control your own life. You're the captain of your soul. You're the master of your fate. You decide what happens. Nebuchadnezzar was in a big surprise, in for a big surprise. When he walks in the wisdom of a whole people, the next minute his mind snaps. And he's reduced to the level of a wild animal. When there's a lot of time given to learn the lesson at passed, 
and his sanity was restored, he came up with some very good biblical theology. He wrote in verse 35, All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, What have you done? You see, for years, the king had lived, in a sense, like he was unaccountable to God. Safety in his own independence and autonomy. And, th and then he learned that pride is delusional. Can I make a few statements quickly? God is the sovereign ruler of earth too, not just heaven. When you read News 24 and you start to see petrol prices gone up, fertilizer prices, which influences food, which influences, and you see that everything's going up and it's going crazy and it's, it's Russia and it's Ukraine and it's this and it's that. And the, the, the nations of this world are still trying to live without God. And he says, really? He says, I will show you that you cannot build something for yourself. There's never been a united nations. There's never been the rights of all humanity. As you know, instead of explorations to Mars, we could take the resources that we spend on space travel and clothe, feed, and home every single person on planet Earth. So why don't we? Because in our pride, in our delusional state, this world says, I don't need God. And God reminds you, I am the sovereign ruler of Earth too, not just heaven. You can't control the weather. You can't control anything. Number two, every breath we draw is from God. Literally every breath you draw. Next point, every day we live is by His grace. A friend of mine, an older friend of mine, been in ministry many years. Two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I started feeling not very well at all. And he said to me, he started peeing blood, but like heavy, heavy, thick blood. And he, he didn't... Went to hospital, they found a, a tumor, a growth between his prostate and his bladder, and they've had it removed, taken for biopsies, but he feels so much better. So he phoned me three days ago. I sent him a message saying, oh, you phoned me three days ago. And he, and, and he said to me, Greg, you know, I used to take just such a simple thing as going to the toilet. I used to take for granted. To just stand over a bowl and go for a pee. Now, when you're young, you think, what's all this about? But you know, the time comes where even that becomes a challenge. Right? It's the way of the world. It's the way everybody goes. And God just reminds us, listen, every day you live is by His grace. Everything you do is because God allows it. Man is not the master of anything. And can I say this? God is not accountable for a single one of His actions. He does what He wants, when He wants, to who He wants, how He wants, and why He wants. And our response is simply, yes, Lord, to a king and a God that is so above us. And lastly, I want to say, pride is earthbound. Pride is earthbound. What do I mean? God sent this affliction on Nebuchadnezzar because God said to Nebuchadnezzar, you are made in my image. And as an image bearer of mine, I created you to look up. And if you look at the end of his life, he says, all majesty, all glory, I exalt, I looked up to, I lift, I lift up my eyes to sanity, I looked up my eyes. But for a number of years, he didn't. And God said to him, okay, you know what? You insist on looking down at your, you're standing on the palace grounds, you're looking down at your kingdom, you're looking down at everything. You refuse to look up, you only look down, then I'm going to help you look down. And I'll help you look down for seven years. And you will look down for the length of time it takes for your heart to break in its pride. That self-sufficiency that says, my life is mine. I say what I want. I do what I want. I release when I want. I hold on to grudges when I want. I do this when I want. I do this. God says, you know what? I'm going to keep you there for seven years until a perfect time, seven times, it was determined. Because God knew that's how long it would take to do a perfect work in the sex life. And then when he did look up, he looked up toward the God of heaven and he said, wow. Now you and I can learn from Nebuchadnezzar's lesson, uh, encounter with God, that nobody is beyond the opportunity of salvation. You can't get anyone as disinterested in the God of Israel than Nebuchadnezzar. Yet God brought him to his knees and humbled him. You know the Bible teaches that salvation is from the Lord, from start to finish. Jonah in chapter 2 verse 9 says, But I with a song of thanksgiving will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I'll make good. Salvation comes from the Lord. When the thing spat him out. Salvation comes from the Lord. Every time someone gets saved in this church, I repeat, I pray over them, Philippians 1, 6, every Sunday. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it to completion until the day of Christ. Friends, two lessons I want you to take out of today. The first is that God will chase every single person no matter how arrogant or prideful they are because he loves them. 
Nobody is beyond the grace of God to be humbled and to come to know Christ. Nobody. Even the worst person you think you know. When God gets a hold of him, he'll bring him to his knees. You need to know that. God will humble anybody. Because God wants to bring people to a place where they understand that their dependency is totally on Him. If you've ever been in that place where the Lord is all you needed, and the Lord is all you wanted, and the Lord is all you had, I dare you to tell me differently, but that your fellowship with Him was at its best. That you found His presence unlike ever before. You were blessed with the knowledge of your God for which you've been prepared for an eternity. And the reason God hates pride is because pride always puts something else in front of God. Never allows Him to be first. But He loves this world enough. I'll tell you something. He will, he'll look after you, but He will bring this world to its knees unless they come to know Him. That's number one. Number two, how's He going to do that? How did God humble Nebuchadnezzar? Gave him a dream. Spoke through a messenger and then used people. God won't bring you to that place until he has spoken to you through a number of people and give you an opportunity. Now, who's to say you're not one of those people that God just wants to use to come alongside the Nebuchadnezzars of this world to just bring your Christian testimony into the world? We have a world so far removed from God and we want to see people coming to know him. And all they have to do is bow the knee now so they don't have to bow the knee then. And you can be the very person, your neighbor, your friend, your whatever, the work colleague, whatever. You've been put in that place to go to those Nebuchadnezzars and to tell them who Jesus is. And in recognizing their need for him, immediately self-sufficiency is replaced with a God-sufficiency. And immediately they realize how much they need him. That's your story. And what does God resist the most? Pride. Stand with me, please. Thank you so much for being a part of our meeting today. Um, can I just ask two things? The first is, if today the, the message has in any way been useful to you, would you mind just maybe liking it or putting... Uh, perhaps a statement down or a comment down that we can know how the ministry has helped you. Maybe a thumbs up. Maybe you can subscribe to the channel. Do whatever. Just so we can know what impact this message may be having on you. And secondly, you may be someone who's saying, Greg, I hear you. And this, this, this hope that Jesus has for us can come into my heart and it can change me. But the reality is that I don't even know if I know Jesus. I want to say two things to you right away. The first is, He's near you right now. The Bible says if you believe in your heart that He is the Lord, and if you confess Him with your mouth, you will be saved. Which means you just need to, where you are, turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, even now, and just say, Lord, here I am. I recognize who you are. I confess my sin to you. I acknowledge you as Jesus Christ, the Lord of all, the Son of the living God. And I want to follow you. I want to become a disciple of yours. I want to, I want to give my life to you, Lord. And you can pray that prayer right now between you and the Lord. Secondly, you can get hold of us. Um, you can see the telephone number. You can get hold of us and say, hey, I've given my life to the Lord. Can you help me from here on out? And we could either send you some material. We can uh, put you in touch with a really good church near you. Uh, if you live in our area, you can come to us. You can follow us on YouTube. But it is good to get connected into the family of God, to get connected into a local church, that your life changes being surrounded with the family of God. Please stay in touch. God bless you.